thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be back again. In particular, I'm very pleased to be on a, such a distinguished panel, and also to be in such a distinguished university, and particularly the department that has distinguished, distinguished itself from providing over a long history resistance against mainstream and traditional policies and providing a very open space for discourse and alternative discussions, something that in particular is extremely important in the current, uh, current political conditions. The presentation that I'm going to give you today is one that uh, I accepted because of my personal esteem for Braga. And normally I would not have done this because up until this point I have tried to avoid any confrontation with the term financialization, which I never quite really understood. So what you're going to see today is my attempt to try and make sense out of financialization and to try and convince you that there is a alternative, a positive alternative method based in the work of you know, obviously Keynes, Heimkinski, and a series of other, uh, of other writers that will allow us to have a better, a better understanding of financialization as an inherent aspect of the development of capitalism, very much in the, in the line that Dragan has already presented and that Robert Gutman has already presented uh, this morning. I start out with a little trick. I always like to keep people awake when we start out, so I entitled this The Difference Between Isomizations because presumably you're supposed to say, what in the world is he going to talk about isms and isms? Well, isms are the things, as I say, that are usually associated with more or less with political scientists. They like to talk about capitalism, communism, socialism, corporatism. You can keep going as far as you want. They can always develop a new ism in which, <laughs> in which they are concerned. Economists, on the other hand, uh, I would argue to tend to concentrate on zations. And the two that I picked out were globalization and financialization. And the first observation that I make is in fact that if you look at globalization and financialization, people normally accept that globalization is something that has gone on for, for some time. Uh, and I make reference to the point of colonization. colonization first aspect of globalization, so we're willing to date globalization quite far back in history. So that my argument is, well, if globalization really starts with colonialization, and colonialization is in fact globalization through the movement of and the exploitation, by means of the movement of finance, whether it was finance in the 17th century, the 18th century, or the 19th century, very quickly we can argue that financialization is really not something that occurred recently, it's something that has been with us for some time, and it would be inappropriate to look at globalization and financialization as different, uh, different characteristics of the operation of the, of the global economy. Now, if we then, I'm going to go quite quickly through these slides because there are about 129 of them or something like that. You can hear from some of them, I hear them all. So the next point that I want to make is that after I had gotten clear in my, in my own mind that financialization really was something that most everybody, if they thought about, would accept as being more or less characteristic uh, of capitalization in the post medieval period, uh, then we should start looking at definitions. And I went through a series of definitions and found that there are multiple definitions. As Robin pointed out this morning, a multiplicity of definitions of financialization, each of them having some sort of contribution to make or identifying one particular, uh, one particular element. 
But the thing which seemed to be characteristic of all of them was one that they were descriptive rather than being analytical. They said, they said, this is what I think globalization is, and they pointed to a particular aspect rather than being analytical. And if we think of financialization as being something that has occurred over the last you know, two or three centuries, then really we should want to have some sort of analytical framework to explain why this occurred. And secondly, that it was based in a certain sense on a dichotomy. And this dichotomy is in terms of the, the context. And I said, I'm going to skip over some of these slides. The dichotomization is basically the idea that somehow or other financialization has shifted the order of dominance in the system from one in which real factors play the more important role and eventually nominal but monetary factors came to play the most important role. Or the idea that finance is dominating production in this particular sense. Okay? Now, this was a representation which I found a little bit strange, and I think it's due to the context in which financialization has been interpreted. And basically, that context is the one that grew out of what we call, all call the monetarist counter-revolution, in which once the monetarists took over the system, everyone was more or less forced to look at this division, bifurcation, between monetary variables and real variables. So financialization then quite automatically became, well, it's the money that is dominating the real. Or in terms of finance, it came to be that financial decisions are in fact dominating the real decisions. Now, the the locus of this particular change, I think, can be found in a particular period in U.S. financial history, recent U.S. financial history, when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Paul Volcker was the head of the Federal Reserve and adopted a quasi-monetarist policy. It wasn't purely monetarist, but it had the connotation of being a money supply control policy was joined to the supply side or incentive, economic incentive policies of the other side of the Reagan administration. So that you had within the administration this sort of division between the supply siders who said, well, it, it, everything depends on the real incentives in the economy. The monitors said, no, it just depends on control of the money supply. And basically, the problem was that the Reagan administration policies broke down because of the conflict these two basic ideas. Now, the question that I'm raising is, is this a good way to look upon the way the system, the way the system functions? And my answer to this is no. And here I'm talking about I'm referring at this stage to Robbie Gutman's very nice uh, representation of this period. Not in the book he was talking about this morning, but the book he published in 1994, uh, which dealt with that particular period of uh, of economic policy. Uh, yeah, so this is for those for those of you who are uh, students of Veblen, I represent this dichotomy sort of in the Veblenesque tradition that somehow or other we believe financialization is the case in which the investment bankers beat the engineers or the vested interests. Uh, so it's, it's this sort of dichotomy that so what I'm saying is that is there another way to look at this? And if you think back to the groundwork of the economic theory that comes out of Keynes' general theory, and we remember a very simple phrase in which Keynes talks about his affinity to Marx's capital. And that phrase says that, well, if you think of the way the capitalist works, the capitalist, in fact, only works in terms of nominal values, money values. He's only interested in the amount of money he spends, he's only interested in the amount of money he gets back, and he doesn't care how much he produces, he doesn't care how many people he employs, he doesn't care how much he pays the people that he employs, as long as he generates a monetary return that is sufficient. So this is our starting point. 
The next point to pick up is to say, if we remember Heinz Minsky's basic idea that capitalism is a system in which the control of financial assets is acquired by means of the issue of liabilities borrowing from the financial system, then we have to amplify Keynes's idea, and this is what Minsky attempted to do in the John Lennon Keynes book, amplify Keynes' idea is that, yes, the capitalist is only interested in his monetary returns, but in order to generate those monetary returns, he has to borrow from the financial system in order to generate those returns. Now, if we look at the functioning of the system this way, it means that we cannot divide it or dichotomize it into a real and a financial sector. Every real decision has a financial dimension, and every financial decision has a real dimension. So that the idea of looking at financialization as one side dominating the other really doesn't make much sense. Okay? So this is the first point that I'm trying to make is that if we want to understand the way that uh, the system actually works, we have to sort of cleanse our brains of this monitor's uh, idea that there is some sort of dichotomy or competition between real and monetary factors, and also the idea that finance is somehow or other the handmade production. If you look very recently, how do we but once again make finance the handmaiden of production? We say, well, finance was never the handmaiden of production. They were joint proprietors of the way the system works. So that if you look at real production, we can say real production simply cannot take place. Goods in progress cannot be created without the simultaneous creation of a financial liability and the intermediation of that financial liability by the, uh, by the financial system. Now, it's very interesting that if you go back to the economic history of the development of the United States financial system, under the work of Parker Willis, who was the architect more or less of the Federal Reserve, you find in his writings and the writings of his students when they're talking about the credit system, the following statement. And the statement is, credit does not originate in the financial system. Credit originates in business. When businesses decide to undertake production, they issue liabilities. That is, it is the credit of the business system that the financial system is willing to accept and validates, or what Minsky would call the acceptance function of the system, okay? So that the credit is really in the real part, and the financial system simply takes that credit and introduces another credit by issuing a means of payment on this, this balance sheet, which then says to us, if we take balance sheets seriously, and we're looking at financialization, any balance sheet interpretation of financialization requires the impact on the balance sheet of real businesses, and it requires an analysis of the impact on the balance sheet of financial institutions and the various financial institutions. So, from this particular point of view, it says that basically what we're looking at as a system in which finance and credit cooperate and in fact, from the point of view, remember we said the basis of the monetary system was the idea of limiting the creation uh, of the money supply. If we look at it from this particular point of view and follow the work which was set out by Schumpeter, Keynes, a whole series of German and Austrian economists, which says that the basic role of the financial system in providing is to eliminate the constraint on the credit of the business sector. Now, this particular statement comes forward that you can read in the work of Albert Hahn, you can read it in the work of Schumpeter, you can read it in the work of Hayek, you can read it in Keynes, 
And that is basically that savings do not limit investment. Why? Because if financial institutions have an unlimited ability to create purchasing power by accepting the credits of the business sector, there can be no constraint on expenditures in the business sector. So the second point, which is, I think, important in understanding financialization, is the fact that we're looking at a system in which there is no inherent or internal constraint on the ability either of the business sector to make expenditures or of the financial sector to, in fact, create financial liabilities that support that expenditure. Okay? So if we're at that particular uh, particular point, we have those two concepts in the back of our minds, then we have to say, well, if we look at the system, what we want the system to do basically is to finance the capital development of the system. And Minsky traditionally at the Levy Institute has a research project <laughs> now uh, have the honor of running which was to try and design the financial system so that it in fact did finance the capital development of the system. Okay? Now, if you ask this question, implicitly what are you saying? Implicitly you're saying that there may be some limit on the ability of the business sector to offer credit to the financial sector. Okay? Why would that be the case? Well, this is why we have case theory of effective demand. Okay? If returns on real investments are not sufficient to justify the issue of liabilities, then financial institutions will not be financing investment. And if at the same time, alternative financial instruments have rates of return that are higher than the expected rates of return, that are in fact available on real investments, then it will make sense, this is how Keynes would put it in preference theory, it will make sense for business firms to hold financial assets, not to make expenditures on investments, not to produce output, and not to provide employment. Now, you notice that here, the onus is all on the decisions of the business firm like the marginal efficiency of capital that Keynes considered to be crucial to the decisions of uh, investors to invest. So implicitly what Keynes is saying is that there is a constraint on the credit that comes from the business sector. Now let's turn this around and look at the counterparty. The counterparty is the financial sector. What is the constraint on the ability of the financial sector to create liquidity? And the answer is, there is no limit. We've already said that there is no supply constraint on the amount of finance. So that the third point, which I'm trying to make, is to say that if you have a divergence of the ability of the financial sector to create unlimited amounts of liquidity, and the reasons that they can do this are multiple, that is, this is not only the reference to fractional reserve banking, we're now talking about the creation, the innovative creation of particular types of financial instruments. The one I like best is simply the existence of derivatives. Okay? A derivative instrument gives you the possibility of creating a long position in an asset with the commitment of usually about 5% of the total value of that commitment. What is this other than the creation of liquidity? outside the formal banking sector, okay? So if the ability of the financial sector to do this is unlimited, then effectively what we have is sort of created a system in which someone runs around with a magic wand. And all he has to do is to use that magic wand in order to create income. Because for the financial system, creation of liquidity is one thing, but the return on the liquidity is the requirement of the creation. If the business sector is unwilling to offer investments in the real sector, what is the financial system going to do? I think you all know the answer to that. They are all going to go out and find 
financial assets which they can invest in. Okay, the liquidity is then turned to what? It is turned to what Minsky called financial layering, or basically we now call financialization. When we look at the increase in the share of financial assets and the share of financial asset income in GDP, basically we've created the genie with a magic lamp that can create as much liquidity as it wants if it can find suitable outlets in the real sector, what does it do? It creates financial assets. Now, as a result of policies that we have followed in terms of uh, we take particular governments and particular approaches, again, I go back to monitor, uh, monitors and the supply side idea, the idea that effectively government should always be running, well, sorry, government should always be running at this surpluses, implicitly what we're saying is that there will always be a deficiency of demand. That is the idea of having a stable government budget says that we are creating a constraint on the demand for finance from the real sector. If we look at our external policy, if we require balance of payment surpluses across the board, we are saying again, implicitly what we're doing is creating a lot traditional economics considers as being stable economic policies, but these are economic policies that generate constraints on the ability of the real sector to absorb the financing capacity that the system is creating endogenously, is creating internally. Okay? So we should say to ourselves, if we do believe, as Keynes did and as Minsky did, that the system will normally be running at less safety or if we believe, as Koleski did, that every time we manage to get to a position in which we are close to full employment, that there is a political response that provides a constraint on real sector activity, then the problem of financialization is again on two sides. It's not that finance is dominating production, it's that production is not able to generate the kinds of demand for finance that would create a level of growth and expansion would be acceptable. And at the same time, the financial sector will simply run off and find things that they can do in order to generate profitability. Okay? So on those sort of three basic steps, I get to the point of saying, number one, financialization, we should not be surprised that it continues to increase. Number two, we should not be bound to the idea that somehow or other financialization is something that is associated with the particular period, particular current period, which it is, uh, which it is occurring. And number three, that, is it, that it is in fact inevitable. It's not inevitable, but it has to be handed, handled on both sides. It's not simply the idea of constraining the ability of the financial system for to create those instruments, although in fact they are crucially important in that, in that particular process. So we have this again, this sort of idea, don't dichotomize, okay? You have to look at both sides of the policy in order to understand how this occurs. Now, this gives us a, a bit of uh, context into the way certain uh, Austrian monitors have proceeded. In fact, the work of Hayek, Hayek well understood the way the system functioned. And what he thought was the solution was to place regulations on the financial system such that savings, such that the creation of finance would be equivalent to savings so that investment was in fact always limited by saving. Think of the Hayek's proposal of mutual money or the 100% monetary, 100% uh, reserve proposals as alternative proposals to attempt to create a financial system which does in fact behave according to the principle that voluntary domestic savings should generate, only, should only generate investment. Of course, as we all know, the problem with this particular approach is that it is impossible to define. Strachan wrote a very nice criticism of Hayek's uh, proposal of neutral, uh, neutral monetary policy. And at the same time, we also know 
that there is no guarantee that the amount of voluntary savings that are going to be produced will in fact generate the amount of investment that would produce full employment or would produce stable and stable living. Okay? So this is the, the first part of the, my sort of personal reflections on trying to understand this exactly what financialization means. The second part is to say, well, can we look at the way uh, the way the financial system has in fact exploited this ability to generate unlimited liquidity and to use that unlimited liquidity in fact to generate what generically we think about as financialization that is this impact of uh, the creation of ever increasing amounts of financial assets in which financial institutions are simply lending that is providing the liquidity for the creation of additional financial assets which create additional liquidity and so forth in terms of a never-ending uh, vicious circle in which we eventually reach a position in which we provide uh, what makes we call the Ponzi financial system. Now, in this respect, I think it's useful to go back to the period of the 1980s, and again, I refer you to Robbie Gutman's book in 1994, which is explanation of this. Uh, I'm going to uh, pick a small fight with Robbie over some of that. I think he forgot a little bit that was in that, in that book this morning. Or perhaps went a little bit too rapidly uh, in terms of the presentation. If we think back to the period of the, the period of the 1980s, as I've already mentioned, this was a period of Reagan supply side deregulation. Uh, and the period in which the monitors uh, counter-revolution became, became dominant. It was also the period in which, um, from the point of view of the financial sector, the financial sector found itself coming out of a period in which the returns from investing in the real sector had been substantially depressed as a result of the oil crisis in the 1970s and other policies that were introduced during that particular period, you think back to the response to the oil crisis, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very old, so I think everybody remembers all of these things. Uh, <laughs> the res basic response to the oil crisis was that it was a term of trade shock. And how do you remedy a term of trade shock? Well, you remedy a term of trade shock by accepting that your real incomes have declined, and you reduce real income. And basically, most developed economies introduce policies in order to provide for the transfer of purchasing power from the domestic economies to the producers of petroleum, which provided, as I've already mentioned, a very sharp uh, negative impact on the level of uh, on the level of demand. And the fact that this stage is started with the idea that the financial sector was no longer engaging in providing financing for productive activities, they were simply doing what? They were circulating or recirculating the petrodollar surpluses. Okay? Now, we're in Brazil. Brazil was a recipient of the petrodollar surpluses. Argentina was a recipient. Virtually every Latin American country was a recipient. But the point was that the banks were not lending against productive activity for the largest part. They were lending according to their the ability to find the borrower. Uh, Sandy Garrity, a good friend of mine, wrote a book on that particular period, which was called The Debt Pushers. Okay? The Debt Pushers in the sense that the debt was the equivalent of a drug, and the idea was to convince Latin American countries to take on more and more of this drug irrespective of whether or not there was any actual productive activity that could be generated. So once the banks got into this idea that it was possible to make substantial amounts of income simply by creating additional financial assets, and you had the liberalization of deregulation, you got to the idea of what at that time was called value extraction. Okay, and this is the point where I'm going to try and amplify a little bit what Robbie said this morning when he talked about the, uh, the movement towards guaranteed shareholder value. 
value extraction was a process which had nothing to do with maximizing shareholder value. It was a process by which you deprived not only the management of the company and the workers in the company, but also the shareholders of the company of the value that was perceived to be inherent in a business. So, for example, if as a value extractor, I found a company that had a very large liquidity position, that liquidity was not being used to finance investment, it was not being used to pay labor, it was simply sitting on the corporate balance sheet because at that time the corporation did not engage in substantial share buybacks and they did not, uh, did not use these to expand their, uh, their wage bills because they were in a period of recession. So what do I do? As a value extractor, I launch a takeover bid for the company. And once I own the company, I extract the liquidity by allowing that company to increase its issue of debt. So I substitute the debt for the actual cash. I take the actual cash. This I pay to my, uh, to my investors. Right? And the company then eventually, because of the size of the debt that it has incurred, can no longer meet its debt payments. So implicitly, what you've done is turn the company into what was or would have been considered as a relatively stable uh, value investor company. It is Warren Buffett who would love this kind of company. You turned it into a Ponzi financing scheme because you've saddled it with so much debt and interest that it can so no longer meet the interest payments, it has to go bankrupt, and this is why I say the shareholders were also expropriated in this process. And this was the beginning of the idea in which financial institutions, and here these were not banks, these were particular uh, private investment funds who engaged in this idea of value extraction justified by the fact that they were increasing the productivity and the efficiency of the U.S. economy. Okay? And the idea was here that you had lax management. If the management had been on its toes, what would have happened? Well, they would have done something with the money in order to generate income. So at that time, there circulated this idea that a very high debt burden for a company was a positive because it made management more cognizant of the fact that they were running an inefficient operation. And efficiency in this case meant what? It meant reducing your costs, reducing employment, and in general, restructuring the company. Now, virtually all of the companies that got value extracted at this point eventually went bankrupt. Okay? So that the shareholders, in fact, did lose all the in response to this, what happened? Well, in response, the management was not stupid. The management said, I have to protect myself, and I protect myself from these corporate raiders by doing what? Well, I can protect myself from having what was called at that time a poison pill. And the poison pill was number one, increasing the indebtedness of the company, so the company was already in debt before the raider came along to take it over, and the management had this, what came to be called golden parachute, in which the company would hold the management so much in the case of a takeover, that in fact the company would automatically become bankrupt and have to liquidate. Okay? So this was the next step. The third step in this was what? The third step was to say, well, if the management is protecting itself, in order to protect itself, it needs the board of directors and it needs the shareholders in order to approve these. And lo and behold, maximizing shareholder value appeared on the scene, and this is where this particular concept came from. So the maximum shareholder value meant what? Meant borrowing up to the limit which was possible, reducing your labor force to the minimum that was necessary, reducing wages to the minimum that was necessary, and creating these so-called lean and mean corporate structures in which they would be maximizing productivity. And as I said, what these things ended up doing was generally 
causing the companies in the end to disappear. Okay? So this is the first example of this idea of the financial sector, in fact, generating its own liquidity. Now, I don't have to mention the name Michael Milken, which I hope you, most of you remember. Michael Milken played a crucial role in this process by doing what? By number one, going to the corporate raiders and saying, I will guarantee to you a big pot of money that you can use in your corporate takeovers, and I will also guarantee to you that I will generate the debt that you're going to use in taking over this company in terms of what came to be called John Bond financing. So implicitly, this entire process in which most of the corporate sector in the U.S. Okay, was more or less decimated, was decimated by this process in which the ability to create liquidity okay, found something to do. And that something to do was simply getting rid of corporate businesses. So it's not only that we have this, uh, this idea that financialization is an increase in the number of financial assets that we create, it was also in these particular cases that it was not only not financing productive activity, it was eliminating productive activity because it could generate returns by doing so. Again, back to the point that if we did not like financialization, and one of my points that in the current period, if you wanted to under financial, understand financialization, all you had to do was read Robbie's book in 1994, and you could predict just exactly what was going to happen to the rest of the, to the, rest of the, uh, to the, rest of the time period. And, and basically, that's how we, uh, how, we got to, how we got to where we are. Now, if you think of this idea of value extraction, and I'll stop here. Uh, value extraction is really very similar to an idea that Schumpeter used called corporate, is, uh, sorry, creative destruction. Only in this case, this is not creative destruction. Okay, this is destruction pure and simple. The value, is, the value creation took out the value, left the shell, and destroyed this group of companies. Now, currently, we have a catchword which is called disruption, okay? Disruption is supposed to be the equivalent of creative disruption, creative disruption. Disruption is what? Well, disruption is PayPal, disruption is Uber, disruption is BNB. I presume you have heard of all of these things because they're not that old, okay? What, what do these things do, okay? They are the direct equivalent of the value extraction that we saw in the large corporations of the 1980s. Only now, in general, this is value extraction of small and medium-sized businesses. I don't know. Many of you may believe that Uber is a very good idea. If you live in New York City and you have trouble getting taxi cabs, you think that Uber is a good idea. If you happen to be a small owner of a taxi cab company, and or you happen to be a driver of a taxi cab, either that you lease from the company or that you own yourself, Uber is not a good idea because it means that your incomes, in fact, will go down and it means that your business is being creatively disrupted. Okay? The money that you used to earn as a small employer running a taxi cab company now goes where? It goes directly to the people who are funding Uber. Okay? Now the interesting point is that Uber has yet to generate what? Any positive income. Okay? If you look at Uber's profit and loss account, it has only generated losses. If you look at its balance sheet, its balance sheet has a balance sheet of what, 80 billion dollars or something? That I think these are numbers that are so large that they are very inconceivable. Okay? The possibility that Uber will ever be able to repay is outside my comprehension. But what comprehension we do have is that we are going to eliminate, if this continues, 
all of the small taxi cab firms in New York City. Now, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, if we look at recent political responses, the political response says that one of the reasons for the kinds of electoral response we've seen has been the reduction in incomes for working class individuals, and you can trace this directly to value extraction and financialization. The second is the decline in small and medium-sized firms which represent middle-class incomes. These are also being rapidly decimated. So it becomes, a much, I think, a much more sensible idea to look at financialization, not only in terms of this idea, somehow or other finances become a bigger part of GNP, but to remember that finance and the real sector are inherently linked, and when the finance sector has an unlimited ability to finance itself, it is going, if you like, in a sense, to go rogue. That is, it will turn on the productive sector and, in fact, devour it. Now, the end game here is what? The end game here is that the only out, because it's systems are not generating incomes, is Minsky's obvious solution that these are all, in fact, Ponzi schemes which will eventually come to grief. The people who have invested in Uber will all lose, hopefully, will all lose their money. Eventually, cab drivers may be able to go back to running cab companies or owning their own taxi cabs and earning reasonable, earning reasonable incomes. Okay, I think I've long, long enough and I'll stop that. Thank you.